so thanks again, uh, everybody, for um, attending our webinar today. Um, my name is uh, Jason Sauer, and I will be the moderator uh, for the presentation. Uh, I'm a new business development manager uh, here at PBI, and I focus on our multi-employer plan uh, segment or industry uh, for PBI. And uh, today's a topic, oh gosh, that we've been getting uh, tons of questions on um, over the past few months. And what we wanted to do um, was uh, gather some of our partners um, and kind of walk through uh, some of the topics for you, uh, specifically discussing um, what some are saying is the most significant effort to protect the solvency uh, for the multi-employer pension system uh, in the past 50 years. Uh, and that's the American Rescue Plan Special Finance Assistance Program. Um, and as you'll see today, uh, we're joined by a panel of our partners uh, who are experts in each of their uh, respective fields. Uh, and uh, they've agreed to discuss the Special Finance Assistance Program, or you'll hear us refer to that uh, possibly as the SFA uh, today, and uh, answer our questions uh, as well. The last thing I wanted to say was uh, just a, a quick disclosure uh, statement that each individual on our panel uh, will be representing themselves and or their respective organizations. Uh, this is an informational presentation today, and we all encourage you uh, to seek the assistance and advice of your plan professionals um, when considering any of the information that's been uh, discussed or shared uh, during this presentation. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, on our panel today, uh, we have a, a few partners that have agreed uh, to help us walk through today's topic or, or the SFA and answer some questions uh, in regard to that program. Um, panelists, at this time, um, if you would take a few minutes uh, and to introduce yourself to the group uh, and give us a brief background, uh, that would be great. I think what we could do is we'll start, uh, if you're looking at your screen, with Ellen all the way to your left, and then um, kind of go through each individual. Um, just a brief introduction, and then uh, we'll jump right into the, uh, the content. So, Ellen, would you start? Absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. Good, uh, good morning, I think, to most people. Good afternoon to a few of us on the East Coast. Um, I'm Ellen klein Stuber. I'm a principal and the chief actuary at Bolton, which is an employee benefit consulting firm headquartered in the Baltimore area and with a, a national client base. A big portion of my career has been devoted to ERISA compliance matters. So things like conducting a death audit and all of the things that can come out of, of the results of that fall really strongly in, in my wheelhouse. Um, I've also been involved on the multi-employer side leading up to the enactment of the Special Financial Assistance, Assistance Program supporting the actuarial profession in their discussions with policymakers um, that helped ultimately lead to the enactment of this legislation. And I've, on a personal note, I've known Jason for many years now, so I'm really grateful that he invited me to be a part of this group. Um, I've worked with a number of the other presenters in various capacities, so it's nice to have uh, the whole group of us together today. And I look forward to helping clarify some of the, the requirements that uh, plan plan sponsors and trustees will face as they go through the SFA process. Awesome, Brigham, if you wanna go next. Yes, uh, thanks Jason. Uh, I'm Brigham Winters. I'm uh, the head of the uh, policy group at Groom Law Group. Uh, we're about a, almost 100 person uh, attorney uh, and professional uh, employee benefits retirement and health firm uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've worked on, uh, you know, ERISA and uh, tax and benefit issues for uh, for a long time. Uh, you know, starting before I went to the uh, Hill as tax counsel at the Ways and Means Committee. Shortly thereafter, after leaving the Hill, and coming back to uh, Groom Law Group, I have worked on uh, a lot of my time on multi-employer issues, starting with the kind of the first financial downturn in the early 2000s, and all the the trials and tribulations in between with different bills and regulatory uh, projects leading up to the special financial assistance legislation. Uh, great to be with everybody today. Uh, 
I'm up next. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Josh Shapiro. I'm a pension actuary. I work at the Groom Law Group uh, with uh, with Brig and Winters. Uh, I've been uh, doing pension consulting work for about 25 years. Uh, prior to joining Groom, I was actually at the uh, the National Coordinating Committee for Multi-Employer Plans. So I spent pretty much all of that time working on uh, policy matters with uh, folks in Congress as well as folks at the regulatory agencies. Uh, just some other quick things for my background. I'm currently on the uh, the board of directors for the uh, Conference of Consulting Actuaries. And uh, you know, prior to that, I served as the vice president for pensions at the uh, American Academy of Actuaries. And I'm Jim Nolan. I work, I've been working at Siegel for the last 20 years. I'm a pension actuary and I focus in the multi-employer industry. And today I'm kind of bringing a practical aspect to the panelists as I've submitted four applications myself and I've got more to come. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, so really in, in taking a look at uh, today's topics, uh, it, we are really covering uh, five general areas. Uh, it, it, certainly with the time allowed, it won't be comprehensive, uh, but you know we do have some directed questions to kind of walk through these five topics and then uh, as mentioned before, we're going to try and allow some time at the end for questions, uh, and we already are starting to get a few, so uh, please feel free to uh, type those in um, as we are presenting, and uh, we'll collect those and uh, try and answer those live uh, at the end. So with that, we're going to jump into our first topic, which is preparing for application and submission. And uh, Jim, I think I'll throw you the, the first question. Um, since we've got attendees today that are most likely at varying stages uh, within the process, or gosh, maybe even still questioning uh, whether they should apply or not, um, what would you say are the most important steps or considerations when preparing for the process? I would say the most important steps you could do is gather with your other fund professionals to find out if you are applying, to find out what steps you're going to do in the application process. And then read through the application documents. There are multiple documents on the PBGC website and uh, go through them and formulate your questions. PBGC is more than welcome, more than welcoming to questions prior to the application process. So you can make things go a lot smoother if you submit your questions ahead of time. And lastly, you mentioned plans that are wondering whether or not they're going to apply. I think, you know, if you read the regulations, trying to get an understanding of, of how the, the, the cost benefit analysis between applying and receiving a little bit of money versus the restrictions that come with SFA uh, if you are going to apply. You know, the recent market downturns have definitely changed some perspective on whether or not a plan can, is going to apply or not. And I guess the relative size of that versus, you know, what could happen in the future with the bounce back and the investments really matters. Great, thank you. Um, and I think a question kind of subsequent to that, Josh, I'll throw it over to you. I mean, if you're looking at uh, preparing or compiling uh, an, an application um, or, you know, in regard to the submission, is that something that, you know, um, plans and realize we have anywhere from national funds all the way down to, you know, maybe locals or things of that nature that are on the phone. Is that something that they can do in house or like what, what's your recommendation in regard to kind of building that team that Jim was talking about? Sure. I would say in the majority of cases, the people that you're going to need to put together the application are, are probably already in place. Uh, all of the actual oil firms, I think, have a pretty good grasp of, of the process and what's needed. And the bulk of the work is actuarial in nature. And it's in my experience, all of the ERISA attorneys out there who practice in the multi-employer area are also pretty well, well versed in this stuff. Uh, I would give kind of two asterisks to that. Uh, one is you mentioned smaller pension funds and there are still, I think, smaller pension funds out there where the fund council obviously knows a lot about ERISA, but is not necessarily an ERISA specialist. They may have a broader practice and ERISA is one of the things that they do. In those cases, it might make sense to reach out to an ERISA specialist attorney who really has a deeper knowledge of the issue 
that a generalist might not necessarily have the same level of depth. And the other one is, we'll talk more about assumptions in a little bit, I think, but if there is a, a possibility of trying to use you know, actual assumptions in the application that are perhaps different from what the fund has used in the past, uh, PBGC, the reviewing agency, is often somewhat, shall we say, skeptical of such such changes. And if there was a second opinion or some additional analysis by a, you know, a third-party actuary that came to the same conclusion as the in-house actuary, that might perhaps bolster the case that the fund is trying to make in its application. Okay, great. I mean, any other comments in regard to uh, the, the first section, in, uh, meaning the application or, or the submission thereof? You know, I, I would like to add, just to tack on to Josh's comments, I do echo what he says. I found it interesting within our firm, since we cover a national, uh, you know, all regions of the nation, is that it depends on the region on whether or not the actuary applies or fund council applies. But Josh mm -hmm. is right, you know, most of the work is, actually, most of the number crunching is actuarial, but there's a lot of paperwork, too, that goes with it. And so that's kind of the the process of who's going to do the paperwork and also who's going to upload the file to the PBGC website as well. So there's a lot of, of back and forth on negotiating those procedures. Great, great. And thanks for the additional you know, comment on that as well. So, I mean, really then looking at the application um, and trying to determine, you know, of submitting that, right? And it's kind of what we've been talking about, um, looking at maybe opportunities as you're doing that or, or possible pitfalls so as you're collecting everything as you're getting everything uh together um brigham when a plan's decided to actually file um are there any opportunities or, or pitfalls like we had just mentioned uh in the process that applicants should be aware of so yes and, and kind of and that's kind of building off of what josh and jim alluded to i mean some some of these assumptions uh, once you've made that determination, determined you're eligible, kind of put your team together. Some of the assumptions and, and, and base data are going to be decided for you. Uh, when you do choose to file, you have certain base data uh, that uh, become locked in, including your, uh, your measurement date, your interest rate, your census data. Um, and that's, that's been defined in the, the final rule as basically the, the kind of last day of the third month before your application. Certain other in determining uh, eligibility and amounts, uh, certain other uh, assumptions are are really the kind of the basis. They are going to be based on your, uh, you know, your last kind of certif certification of uh, critical and or critical and declining status uh, before January 1st of 2021. So those are are gen, you know, generally presumed to, to be in place as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of tee this up for our actuary friends. There are certain places though, where there are some decisions that have to be made or can be made if you want to deviate from those kind of locked in assumptions. Uh, basically the, the final rules require that uh, to, to move off of those, the original ones have to, to be unreasonable. So that's kind of one, I think that may be fits in both the opportunities and pitfalls. The pitfalls, because if you do deviate from those assumptions, there may be more scrutiny provided by PBGC and maybe in an enhanced likelihood that they deny uh, your initial application, which you know we've seen in a number of cases. And then just briefly, another, another possible consideration in, in the opportunities and pitfalls area would be you know, the decision of when do you apply some of that's decided for you because there are various tiers in the final rules of when you can apply. But once you are eligible, uh, then I think there's some determinations that have to be made on when is it most advantageous for the plan, especially given the uh, downturn in the equity and bond markets that we've seen over the last year. Okay, awesome. It, and I mean, really to play off of that too, I mean, Jim, in thinking through kind of the application process or you know uh, pitfalls um, if you will i mean are, are there any dangers or are there any places where you know um either you're learning new information or you know a process has changed or any of those types of things um that would represent an issue for somebody who's actually um uh, you know submitting an application 
I wouldn't say uh, that it would provide an issue. I would say it would cause the PBGC to have pause and thought. Um, but you know, if you're, I've had a plan where they changed. You know, they were in the process of changing TPAs before they applied. There was really no hiccup there because you know, you're working off of data you've already received. Uh, and other vendors, as long as you have the information provided and you can document uh, the information, I, I think the PBGC is, it works with that. So just make sure you're getting proper documentation. Uh, in terms of the process it, itself and the application, I discovered a few things that I just want to make sure uh, we cover. And Brian touched on one of them, which is the reasonableness of the assumption change. So. There's assumption change guidance on the PBGC website. It's non-binding. So it doesn't mean that you actually have to adhere to everything that is included in the, in the non-binding guidance, but it's highly recommended that you read through that and you follow it as close as possible. I would say what's not mentioned is, you know, they are gonna adhere to stricter actuarial standards if you are changing assumptions. Hmm. And for example, one of my cases, even though the assumption was uh, used in the 2020 zone certification. Uh, my mortality table was required to be changed. It was recommended because it didn't actually comply with the credibility standards that are in ERISA 430 for uh, 430H, I believe it is, for single employer plans. And so that was a little surprising. That's kind of a gotcha thing. Uh, more like, okay, well, we'll change it. Uh, it didn't really change the results, but again, as an actuary, you know. I can mm -hmm. understand why they would want me to update the numbers because of some adjustments we made, either a setback or an adding to a Q uh, value for the old assumption and then going to a just a straight mortality table for the new assumption. Okay. And one, awesome. and one other, real quick, one other thing to note is certain assumptions you may not have, you may not have assumptions that go out 30 years for certain things. So we've, mm -hmm. we found that, Josh and I found on Things like withdrawal liability projections and their and their relationship with contribution projections. You, there, there may not be any of those. They they are they may have been for a much shorter time period. So there will be work that will have to be done, particularly for certain types of, of funds, to to put that data together in such a way that the PBGC will accept it. Got it. Well, Got it. And, and you do have to stay. One of the things I found interesting is that for every assumption change, which includes this extension, like, you know, your assumption only goes to a certain point, mm -hmm. is that you have to express why the old assumption is unreasonable and then why the new assumption is reasonable. And that expression has to be in separate paragraphs. You have to clearly state why you're, you're getting rid of the old assumption, state the new assumption, and then state why you're using the new assumption and why it's reasonable. Got it. Got it. And obviously another reason from even where we just started out, right, with uh, the types of folks that you're going to be working with, submitting the application, who you're relying on for, you know, the data, all of those pieces. But it, it sounds like a big key of it um, is uh, in collaboration with the PBGC. So it, as long as, you know, you're open, uh, communicating back and forth, things of that nature, the process sounds like um, you can collaborate with them on, on any of the, the issues, any types of corrections or, or things of that nature. I, I would agree with that. They might not give you a, a straight answer uh, because they have to uh, be careful in what they say, uh, sure. given their government agency, but they'll definitely point you in the right direction. Awesome. Awesome. I, I, would, I would second that. There's an awful lot of reading between the lines that's required. If they're... <laughs> going to say no to your application they will not generally say by the way we're going to reject your application hmm. but that will become abundantly clear i think if you listen carefully to what they have to say and follow their 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 indications so uh awesome definitely gonna focus on the context yeah no that's great i mean in in just uh like uh i guess a fact right i mean if you look at all of the applications that have been submitted so far um you know have there been any that you guys know of that have been uh, declined at this point or you know is it more in that collaborative effort of just going back and forth and trying to make sure you know that everything's you know documented the correct way and, and all of those pieces yeah, no, a number have been have been denied uh but it's usually and so there's usually back and forth and they it becomes very clear why they uh would 
uh, well, I actually, I, I take that back. Has any, anything actually been denied? I, I guess nothing's actually been denied. It's, it's usually, it would be denied if you don't pull it and refile. Mm. And it's okay. clear from that process, which thing, which, which elements need to, to be changed. So I, I don't have the exact tally, but uh, a number of the eventual approvals were, were pulled and then refiled. Jim okay. and Josh yeah. may know that off top. I think a rough justice, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of half of the applications have been withdrawn after they were submitted. And I think it's fair to say that substantially all of those would have been denied had they not been withdrawn. PPTC made that clear. They were withdrawn and resubmitted. So it's 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 a de facto denial, but they actually don't go through with the denial most of the time or all the time so far. Got it. Got it. Thanks for the clarification. So I, I, I think that's kind of segues right into kind of what we were talking about or one of the topics when we were talking about like the calculation, the timeline behind it, or, you know, gosh, even the use of uh, SFA funds. So, I mean, I, I'll kind of throw this uh, at least initially to, to Jim or, or, or Brigham. Um, I mean, talk to us a little bit and Jim, maybe you want to start first because of you know your tactical experience. But, um, you know, talk to us a little bit about the process, you know, regarding uh, kind of the timelines and the calculations, and then Brigham, if you kind of want to uh, expand on that as well, that'd be great. Yes, timelines, uh, well, first there's priority groups. So, you know, be, make sure you're, you're applying within your appropriate timeline for the priority group, and then, and then come March 11th is this upcoming March 11th when it opens up to the entire population. Um, my understanding is that they're going to come out with some rules. I mean, could you imagine with the recent downturn in the market and the change in in interest rates, and there's been a lot of tactical looking at to see if one month is better than the other, but mm -hmm. clearly right now, uh, it seems like applying as early as possible because of the fact that, you know, the market declined and now might be starting to come back uh, or at least leveling out. Uh, and then the fact that interest rates are rising really fast, uh, it, it, it just makes it more advantageous to have your measurement date in the past uh, than it would waiting to see what would happen. But there is a there's a, a there's an effective option there um, for those who are going to apply with the lock-in application or on the March 11th because you know you have a measurement date that's in the past, and if you don't apply for two years, you should consider that like. Well, what would it be like if there was a downturn uh, again, or this is a slow recession, you get a zero. So just stuff to think about when you're when you're uh, looking at those March 11th applications. I know my name wasn't called, but if I can just jump in there for one second and pick up on that point, because I think that's really a key point is, you know, investment experience that happens prior to when you apply affects PBGC, it doesn't necessarily affect the fund because PBGC will adjust its assistance to take that into account up or down. Investment experience that occurs after you apply, that's obviously the fund's problem. So in terms of which one ends up being more advantageous, the question is, do you think the market is going to be going up or going down? And if you have strong feelings on that question, that could drive when you might want to apply because it affects who is affected by that experience, you or PBGC. And then another another consideration, you know, obviously funds I think are going to be thinking about, and I don't think that there's any, there's no kind of imminent threat here. I think it's going to be more um, optics, maybe some headlines, maybe some some hearing activity. But there 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 will be a change in the control of the House of Representatives starting in January. Uh, certain uh, kind of committee leaders, in particular, on the Ed, now Ed and Labor Committee, will be uh likely renamed the education and workforce committee uh, in the new year have uh have you know have said they're going to do a lot of oversight in certain areas and uh one of those areas is the multi-employer uh plan uh area in, in particular the special financial assistance program so you could you're certainly going to see i think some oversight and act hearing activity in this area you might see some proposed legislation or even acted on legislation that could make some changes, uh, attempt to make changes uh, in this program or and or go after agency uh, funding to 
try to put the thumb on the scale of how this program is implemented. I don't think any of that's going to result in any enacted legislation to end the program, at least in the next couple of years, with uh, uh, Senate control still being in uh, Democrats' hands and and that the Biden administration is still in place. But that could, down the road, I could see that influencing some some plans and how, how fast they want to apply. Overall, applications have to be submitted uh, by the end of 2000. 25 and then refiled applications by the end of 2026. So that's a kind of overall drop dead date. But that that is something that, that I think uh, plans will be doing some uh, consideration of. Awesome, awesome, thanks. And, and I mean, it, kind of along the same lines, uh, let's talk about after um, the application has been approved, right? So you're receiving funds. Um, it, Josh, Ellen, I mean, are there any restrictions in how you can actually use those funds uh, at this point? Well, I'll start on that. Um, yes, there, there certainly are. Um, you know, the, the, the SFA money is kept separate from your existing assets. It is up to the plan sponsor to decide, you know, from which set of funds they want to pay benefits going forward they could pay out of general assets or they could pay out of sfa that's that's a plan sponsor decision but because of the next topic I'll, I'll mention that first decision becomes fairly easy most of the time uh there are restrictions on how the sfa money may be invested and at a, at a very high level you can put up to one third of it into what they call return seeking assets which is you know riskier investments such as such as uh, equities and things of that nature uh, while well, two thirds of it have to stay in corporate uh, investment grade bonds. Uh, so because of those restrictions on how SFA money may be invested, that gives plan sponsors a pretty powerful incentive to pay benefits out of that pool of funds because their existing assets, their other assets, there are no restrictions on, on those. They can invest that however they feel is appropriate. So there are restrictions and it kind of drives how the money is likely to be used going forward. Yeah, I think just to, to add on to that, you know, the, the PBGC has been pretty clear about, you know, what, what they consider to be an investment grade, fixed income investment. Um, you know, so you can't use things like high yield, you can't use fallen angels, it used to be investment grade. And they've been, um, they've identified certain specific types of investments, so private placement, convertible bonds, um, some of the more uh, like collateralized loan obligations. And interestingly, annuity purchases, right, are not allowed to be used. And the, the rationale for it is they don't want to have the SFA funds to be used to give higher priority or higher security uh, to retirees to the potential disadvantage over the long term of, of active or term vested participants. Um, you know, so when you look at how do you want to go about using the, the money and how do you want to structure the investment uh, grade fixed income portfolio, there's a few different strategies you can use. I, I agree with Josh, there's a very strong incentive to have that be the source of cash that comes out. Um, but you could also draw some of that cash out from the return seeking investments and then use the, uh, the true fixed income portion of it to do some things like duration matching or creating a laddered bond portfolio where you would immunize the plan. So basically what you're doing is a technique that's used a lot in the single employer space is go out and buy individual bonds whose cash flow is coming back, the dividends or return principal is going to match the benefit payments you expect to have to pay out over some period of time. Maybe you say for the next 10 years, I'm going to make sure I've got all my benefit payments covered. And then as the, the dividends come back in, you use those to pay your benefits. And that could allow for taking a little bit more aggressive approach with the portion of the SFA money that is in return seeking investments and the non SFA assets. Um, so there's a number of different ways you can do it. Of course, you can always use uh, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, or collective trusts as well and do more of a duration matching approach than trying to actually match the cash flow. So there's a lot of work, I think, for these, these funds getting SFA money to do with their actuary, with their investment advisors, uh, to see how they want to, what's gonna be the most optimal approach for each fund, because it could be different fund to fund. Awesome. And then, uh, bringing it in regard to like, I guess, actual movement 
of money, right? So you've been approved, um, the funds are coming over. Are, are there specifics that are defined in regard to where you receive those monies or you know how they need to be held or commingled or things of that nature? Yes, I mean, as, as Josh alluded to, the, the basically the statute and the regs say that the SFA assets have to be segregated from other plan assets. Uh, uh, and I think that there is preamble language basically saying that really means that they need to be held in a, in a separate uh, account. So there needs to be separate uh, accounts kind of governing these two pools of money, given the, the different rules on the, you know, what SFA can be used for, uh, as well as the restriction, you know, the different rules on investments that Josh and Ellen just uh, went through. So I think what we're seeing is we're seeing plans really have set, you know, set up uh, separate accounts and, and have those go into segregated separate accounts. The other thing I'll just to, to build on what Josh and Ellen said on the investment side, I think every plan is going to be in a different situation in terms of kind of where they want to and need to and, and invest and how much risk they want to take. And I think we are definitely seeing some changes in that area as interest rates continue to arise mm -hmm. and maybe provide some more opportunities on, on that side and, and, and maybe less need uh, for uh, kind of risk on the kind of the equity or return seeking sides. But that, again, that's going to depend on each plan situation and, you know, kind of their relative, you know, how much uh, assistance they're receiving versus their current assets and what their situation is. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Hey, before we move into the administrative part, any other comments from the panel uh, in regard to uh, timeline, funds, um, you know, any of the calculations, dangers, anything of that nature? Nothing further from me. I think we covered it quite well. All right, awesome. Then we'll move to the, the last portion, uh, which is really talking about kind of the administrative uh, issues um, around, you know, uh, submitting um, uh, data, uh, things of that nature. Ellen, I, I think I'll throw this uh, initial one at least over to you. Um, you know, is a death audit required uh, for the program? And, you know, uh, on top of that, if you will, does it matter what type of a, uh, what I'll call a death service is used? So uh, can it be the social security death master file only? Um, can it be that plus state records? Is there anything in consideration of using uh, obituaries or additional death sources? So uh, I'll throw that over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um... You know, I think, well, so first things, let's start with what we know, right? So yes, the PBGC does require that there be a death audit performed. And as part of the application, they want uh, trustees to identify who the vendor is that they used um, and provide a copy of the audit results that were provided from the search vendor to the plan administrator. So, you know, a lot of the, the outside search firms like, like PBI, um, have a more robust formula that they use, their secret sauce, so to speak, beyond the death master file that can help catch, capture additional information. And it might have been my experience that years ago, the death master file used to be something that was very easy for people to tap directly into. It's become much more difficult with some of the um, privacy concerns and cybersecurity concerns. So, you know, it might be worth investing in using an outside search partner for that. Uh, that way you know you're going to get a, a robust reporting that you can provide to the PBGC is going to look good as part of the application. Um, we'll come back maybe to the obituary source in a minute. So when you look at the, the, web, the directions that are on the PBGC website currently as part of the general filing instructions, they say that the death audit has to be performed no more than a year before the plan's SFA measurement date. Um, now some of us on the, the panel uh, became aware just this morning, um, there's a rumor that uh, there's a hot off the presses update that may be um, provided by the PBGC to those general filing instructions on the website that adds some more clarity about what exactly it is they want to be, uh, want to be happening. So I wanna keep an eye on the, web, on the website 
for this to come out. But our, our understanding is that PBGC may be heading towards a clarification that is more specific about when the death audit should be done or specifically what it should be done on. So there's, it's, we think they're going to say that going forward, they want to see the death audit performed on the census data that's used to complete the SFA filing. And that, so that would mean if there's any known deaths that occurred before the date of the census data that's used to determine the SFA amounts in the application, that they want to have those deaths reflected in the SFA calculations. So there's also some guidance um, on the PBGC website in their assumptions guidance document that uh, talks about how the death audit is used and when it should be performed. Um, so they want, it sounds like going forward, they're going to add another requirement talking about the death audit that they want a statement confirming that any deaths known to the plan administrator before the census date were reflected in the census data that's used in the SFA cal calculations. So even before this uh, latest rumored update from the PBGC, you know, I would suggest uh, this is an opportunity to provide the PBGC with some narrative around the process that was followed and then what was done to reflect the outcome of that death audit and any known deaths occurring before the census date. So, for example, um, you may find out that someone is deceased, but you don't know if they have a surviving spouse or some other beneficiary and exactly what benefit will be payable because it may vary depending on whether um, the person was married or not. And so it's an opportunity to explain to the PBGC any assumptions that you had to make in the census data to adjust for known deaths where you have incomplete information about the identity of a surviving beneficiary. Um, so this could be an opportunity to take that extra step and use something like an obituary search or a decedent uh, beneficiary search to see if you can get some more concrete information on what the death benefits might be owed um, and how you want to structure your census data and then what you want to explain to PBGC that, that you've done. Um, you know, so I think the obituary searches can be helpful in it. There's nothing uh, that we're aware of that specifically says you have to do that. I think, again, this falls into that opportunity and we've, we've heard some of the other panelists talk about you know, you know, the PBGC is, is there to be as consultative as they can. And the things that they ask of us is give them the best information that we have in order to help them assess sort of the totality of the application, the process that was followed, how you got to the answer that you got to when you're asking them for this SFA money. The more you tell them, the more you're able to explain how things were done and demonstrate that you follow a very rigorous process in this, the better position they are to look at this and say, okay, like, you know, these guys have done what we asked them to do. Doesn't mean that you're not going to ask questions. It doesn't mean that there aren't things they're going to push back on or poke at a little bit. Um, but the more you can tell them up front, this is one of those situations where sometimes more is more. I, I would like to echo that too. Uh, you know, especially on the death audit comment and using a third party vendor, I would, I personally would highly recommend all my clients to, to use one, uh, mainly because in one of my applications, uh, they, even though it was under the interim final rule, at, but it was after the final rule came out, they asked, they said, when have you done a death audit? How often do you do it? What third party vendor do you use to find these death audits? So I would, so to look at, you know, see how thorough is the process that you're using? Is it is it beneficial to get one or, or is your internal staff uh, up enough or strong enough in order to, to do it to, if you're thinking about it, like if a government agency was going to poke around in there that they would be satisfied with your answer. Got it, got it. And, and obviously, just like with what Ellen was saying about it, I mean, help them help you right so the, the more you can provide uh you know in the spirit of collaboration you know with the pbgc uh, that's going to be helpful okay uh great is there in specifics in looking at that and you know uh, my mind kind of goes to um you know ellen even what you had just mentioned about maybe uh some new information um is there additional 
I guess what I'll call like a look back or, or something of that nature. So you've made your assumptions, um, you've collaborated back and forth with the PBGC, um, you know, you've received the funds, you've put them in the right place, you know, allocated them, you know, all of those pieces. It, at this point in regard to what's kind of been laid out, is there a uh, like a look back period that would look at the assumptions and maybe even specific around death audit? Um, you know, uh, where they would take a look at things after the fact, just to make sure that assumptions were uh, correct. Uh, I, you know, I think generally, no, that's the good news in this, right? That, that the, the application process, what they're, what they're saying, so let's, again, let's take deaths and mortality, right? Because these two go hand in hand. So doing a death audit is helping you to make sure that when you're preparing your application, you have a good census and you know, as of that census date, who is expected to get benefits in the future. And then you couple that with an assumption on mortality or longevity, however you wanna think about it. And that assumption takes over from the date of your census going forward and says, here's what we expect is going to happen. So Jim had talked earlier about the PBGC looking very closely at the assumptions and making sure that they're comfortable that the assumption that you're using for what happens from the date that census stops and your future experience that we're modeling takes over, um, that they're comfortable with what that assumption is gonna look like. And once they've done that, they don't go back after they've given you the money and say, oh, well, hey, we found out that you had a bunch of deaths that occurred right after the census date. We wanna true up for the fact that you had more deaths in that short period than what your assumption may have reflected. Like that's the whole nature of assumptions. It's an expectation with the understanding that things will not play out exactly as that assumption assumes that, you know, presumes that it will. And those gains or losses, you know, fall out in the wash. We heard that earlier with the investment side of it, right? If you have information about which way investments are heading, that can lead you towards an earlier or later filing date. You know something about what's likely to happen after that measurement date with respect to actual experience versus assumptions. But the PBGC sets that measurement date. Once you set it and they accept it, whatever actually happens after that, that's how that's the, the chips fall where they may. Now there is other, as we've heard about, there is other monitoring that will go on and there will be requirements for funds to, fu to make filings um, to support the monitoring of you know, the use of the SFA funds. But we haven't heard or seen anything that suggests the PBGC is gonna go back and try to true anything up or claw money back if they okay. find out that experience has actually differed from the assumptions that they blessed. Got it, got it, okay, great. Thanks for the clarification on that. All right, any other comments from the panel in regard to um, the administration uh, portion of this? I'll just sort of add on, you know, we, we focused on dealing with it with death and the audit part of it and how you trip the census data. And I'll just point out that there's other, you know, the, this is a PBGC regulatory effort but there are other agencies out there that have um, jurisdiction over aspects of plan administration. For example, the IRS and required minimum distributions. If you may do your death audit and find out that someone is deceased and that leads you to, okay, how do I structure my census data for the SFA application? But in determining what your future benefit payouts are gonna be for that person, you may also have some other compliance corrections to deal with. Do you have missed requirement on distributions? Are you gonna have retroactive payments? Are you applying actual increases versus making retro payments? So there's some other compliance issues that can kind of fall out from the results of your death audit. You may find missing, missing participants as part of this and now you have um, retroactive distributions to make or, or, or RMD issues to deal with. So, um, you know, I think as giving us, it's, it's this, this tight this tightrope that we're we're walking that you have to do the death audit once you have your census data done once you think you have your census data done but then your death audit may change your census data and you have sometimes have a limited amount of time between that census date and the filing date to be able to 
clean this up and make adjustments and finding people and putting these corrections in place can take more time than you have. So you may be in a position where you have to make some reasonable assumptions as to what your census data is going to look like for the SFA filing, get through that process, get PBGC comfortable with it, and then don't forget to loop back when you still have the underlying compliance corrections to deal with. Finding people, putting them into payment, um, paying retro benefits, dealing with missed RMDs could require an IRS filing. Um, missing participants, you have the Department of Labor, very, very interested in how plans are dealing with missing participants. Um, so we know that, you know, we do know that the different agencies speak to each other. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that PBGC is going to narc on people to one of the other agencies. But, this, but we know that there's agencies that are interested in issues that are not completely unrelated to some of the things you'll deal with um, in preparing the census for the SFA. So good, good opportunity, I would say, as we go back to the earlier conversation, it's a good opportunity to take this as a time to clean up your census data hmm. and deal with some of these other things that you may have lingering out there. Um, so that when you get the money in, both when you're applying for it and when you get it in, you really have tightened up your um, estimates as an actuary on what the benefits are going to be that are going to be paid so that you get the, the most out of the money that you're receiving under the SFA program. And then even for multi-employer funds that aren't going to be eligible for SFA, some of these things can be valuable tools for you as well. Run a death audit, see who you have out there. Make sure that the people who are due benefits are getting the benefits that are due to them. And you find that when you learn who's deceased and you go search for a surviving beneficiary or when you find your missing participant. So it's not just, it's not, yes, it's about getting the right numbers in front of the PBGC and getting the right money. But for all funds, it's about making sure that the right benefits are paid to the right people at the right time in the right amount. Yeah, certainly. And I mean, you know, where, best practices would apply, it would apply regardless of whether, you know, uh, you're in the SFA program or whether you're, you know, managing uh, a single employer plan. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Thanks for those comments. Uh, any other comments? Um, other than that, I'm looking at our time. We've got a few minutes left. Um, I, I do have a few questions that we can move to, but uh, before we do that, um, Josh, Brigham, Jim, any uh, additional comments or anything you'd like to bring up? I think for me, let's see what the questions are. Oh, there yeah, you got it. You're right. These are always fun because it's always the Wild West sometimes. So I will do my best at um, translating, uh, and then we'll uh, either do a round robin or if somebody you know wants to jump in, uh, you know, please feel free to do so. So, um, well, oddly enough, single employer plans. Uh, so, any updates on how ARPA uh, affects single employer pension plans at this point? How about if I jump in and take that one? Because most of my practice um, has been, at least my direct practice has been with single employer plans. Okay. So, ARPA did include some relief for single employer plans, but it's very, very different than the SFA program, right? Because the, the needs of the single employer um, plans are different. So both both single employer and multi-employer program plans have PBGC insurance coverage. They're two separate insurance programs, and there's almost like a Chinese wall between the two of them. Like they don't blend together. So they have a different premium structure. They have a different benefit guarantee. The SFA program, just to give some quick background, really was meant to kind of save the multi-employer system. And the, the approach that was taken is let's save the plan so that the PBGC program stays strong. The single employer side, the PBGC program, single employer program's financial status is pretty good. Um, they're pretty solid. So here it's more about providing plan sponsors with relief on cut from contribution requirements. So there've been, as interest rates declined and declined and inclined for a number of years, there were, um, challenges and with increasing contributions because unlike multi-employer plans single employer plans value their benefit liabilities you tied to bond rates 
So as, as bond yields go down and down, single employer liabilities go up and up and as do their contributions. So for the single employer um, program plans, ARPA extended some of the interest rate relief that has been had been provided previously under um, legislation in 2012 and 2015. And now, so ARPA first extended it, and then the Infrastructure um, Investment and Jobs Act that was passed later in 2021 further extended it. So now the, the interest rate relief um, that, put, that puts a 5% floor on the interest rates that we use, it has some higher rates that can be used in the interim and they start to phase out. That phase out period was extended. And then where the plans have unfunded liabilities that are being amortized, the amortization period was extended from seven years under the original Pension Protection Act legislation to permanently being 15 years. So they have a little bit more time to pay off the unfunded liabilities. So bringing the, the single employer plans, the funding rules and everything about them um, aside from being ERISA covered plans are very different than multi-employer. They've, and pre-Pension Protection Act, pre-2008, single employer, multi-employer plans were, were funded identically. They follow the same rules. Now they've brought the single employer rules back just a little bit more towards multi-employer. We get a little bit longer amortization periods. We get a little bit of a relief on using these very low interest rates. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's see. We will move to the next one. Oh, this one's actually uh, a good question. Uh, does our plan have to be underfunded uh, to get assistance? And then uh, they've got a, a subsequent um, one. Or can we get funds to help with processing a termination of a plan? I can start on that. Oh, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, you know, you could be eligible and be pretty well funded, but um that doesn't mean you're going to receive money this is effectively you have to be going insolvent prior to 2051 under certain assumptions uh, in order to receive any money whatsoever if you're if under the sfa assumptions your plan is going to be solvent through 2051 you'll receive no money whatsoever mm -hmm. and i think based on ellen's comment regarding the annuity purchases uh you know multi-employer plans can only terminate a few ways one is by plan amendment which i don't think any plan has ever done the other one is by purchasing annuities, but if they're restricting the purchase of annuities, then terminating the pension plan, uh, getting additional funds to terminate the pension plan or even think about it is going to be near next to impossible. I don't think the idea of terminating a plan after or in conjunction with the receipt of assistance has really been heavily contemplated. There, there is a rule that says if you are already terminated, then you cannot receive assistance. That's a, a rule. It doesn't st specifically say that you couldn't then terminate later, hmm. but how that would work, I think, is something that really hasn't been addressed. I think that's not sort of that's not the idea of the legislation. And if a fund wanted to kind of go that route, uh, I would suggest you probably should reach out to PBDC and start a dialogue to get a sense of how they would view that, because I'm not sure it really has been that that well contemplated thus far. OK, great. Uh, let's see. Oh, we've got time for a couple more. Um, Here's one in supplemented applications. Uh, can you change the projected dollar amount of future withdrawals based on the July 9th exclusion? So, uh, does somebody want to pick that one? I, I would, uh, my initial gut is saying no okay. uh, because of the fact that withdrawal liability already has a restriction on, on the contributions that apply, contribution rate that applies. Uh, which was put in by MEPRA. Uh, so if you're a red, you have to be a red zone plan effectively in critical status. So you have this restriction that applies. Um, so I can't imagine a contribution rate unless I guess you're already improving benefits with it. So it, that would be a very unique strategy there or a unique situation. And I would highly recommend you reach out to the PPGC and ask them on that one because I can't imagine how that would actually apply in the situation. Um, but if it did apply, then you really do have something sticky you might want to think about. Got it. My instinct is in the same direction, although I have a somewhat different rationale. And I'm, I'm working from memory here, which is always a dangerous game, especially with me. But if I remember the supplemented application, again, this is memory, 
I think has to have the same assumptions aside from a few spe specific carve outs as was in the original application. And I think that might fall under the heading of an assumption that you're locked into. So I'd wanna go back and double check that myself before I, my name on that answer officially. But my sense is the same as Jim's for an additional reason that I'm not sure that you're even allowed to. Got it. All right, uh, we've got two more. Uh, for an insolvent plan, that receives SFA. Uh, how are funding valuations done going forward? I'll give a, or Jimmy, you want to see you start out there? Or one of us can I mean, that, you know, plans can be insolvent and ongoing. And so ERISA and PBGC are two separate entities. You know, most valuations are for the Schedule MB. And so you're, you're complying with ERISA, making sure, you know, the contributions coming in are, or, you know, the employer doesn't have to pay, doesn't have to deduct the contributions or doesn't have to pay excise tax on the contributions. And so uh, I'm assuming you're, it's gonna be, since these plans are ongoing, uh, you're gonna continue with the valuation process uh, and make your, your best estimate assumptions and, and move forward from there. And since you have more money in the plan, and that's something you're gonna need to consider how that affects uh, the investment allocation going forward and, and and how that affects your underlying funding interest rate. Hmm. And I, I concur with that. I think uh, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, but it, a non-terminated insolvent multi-employer plan and such things exist, do prepare minimum funding valuations. For what purpose, it's hard to say because they have hmm. no money, it's a, it's a zero, but you still go through the motions as if you had a, were a true ongoing plan, because in a certain sense you are, so such a plan is already doing a valuation for that purpose. And I think the valuation would most likely be the same as it is now after the receipt of SFA. I, I don't know that it would change that. Okay, great. Uh, time for one last question. And this is actually, uh, uh, looks like I'm reading it off here, um, directed towards the actuaries in the crowd. Uh, so it says, is an actuary factoring in an assumption that deaths are being missed within the term vested population. So, um, you know, are those assumptions included, I guess, um, in, you know, preparing the information um, or, you know, submitting the application? I, let, I me would know, say let me know if you need that, it. And the okay. PBGC has addressed this with sometimes, uh, if you read pension valuations in the back of them, there'll be exclusions for inactive vested participants over a particular age. Mm -hmm. And the PBGC has come out with guidance. Uh, I think if you look in their, uh, their they, they addressed it originally in their question and answer section, but basically, you know, age 85 is an important age. Uh, if the participant is over age 85, you might be able to, you, you'll have to, you know, probably exclude them if you already had this assumption in there, but if they're under, you might be able to include them. So it's just something to think about. So sometimes the actuary does do that. I guess it just depends on what your assumption was prior to the you know, SFA or prior to ARPA being enacted. So what was in that, that uh, zone certification that was filed prior to that date, forgot the date. Got it, got it. Anybody else uh, wanna come in on that question? Oh, and I agree with Jim's comments as always. I, I've never seen an explicit assumption for terminated vesteds who are younger than say age 80 who might be deceased unbeknownst to the plan. Usually, you know, those people are assumed to be alive and then there's some cutoff age where if you get past mm -hmm. that age and the fund hasn't found you yet despite its best efforts, it's assumed that they're never gonna be found probably because they're already deceased. But uh, building in something beyond that is for me would be unfamiliar. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. And actually with that, um, we are at 1230. So uh, we want to be respective of everybody's um, you know, time. Um, we did get a couple additional questions. Uh, what we will do is um, we'll document those, uh, disseminate those to the group, um, and then uh, we will circle back uh, with everybody in regard to those questions. And then lastly, in, re in regard to the new information um, uh, that the panel was uh, discussing or that Ellen had mentioned, um, you know, we'll try and get some clarification on that in regard to the, uh, the death audit timing, things of that nature, and also uh, deliver that as a follow-up to this as well. 
But any questions, um, you know, anything that drives out of this, if you guys need anything from us, um, you know, please let us know. Uh, you do have all the contact information in front of you. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to the uh, respective person that is there. Or if you want to direct it to PBI, we can certainly try and spearhead that uh, as well. So with that, thanks for everybody on the panel uh, for your time today and for uh, answering some questions and walking us through everything. And uh, we'll wrap that up and uh, hope everybody has a great day. And uh, if we don't talk to you, happy holidays.